You're welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a presentation on data validation and quality assurance within your case management systems. Um, my name is Donald Carter. I'm a senior consultant at Just Tech. I have a um, uh, 20 to 25 years experience working with database design, implementation, and administration. Um, you name it, I've played with it, uh, broken it, put it back together. Uh, my co-host is David Johnson from the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. David, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, Don. Um, the uh, I've uh, I guess I've worked more in. Um, analyzing and finding sort of trying to show people what their data can actually tell them and how they can refine systems uh, and methods of gathering information so that their analyses are more useful to them and helpful to them. And I've done that in a variety of areas and moved into the legal aid area about three years ago. So. Okay, so to kick it off, what is data validation and quality assurance? Well, if any of y'all remember the a certain election, the picture on the right there will tell you everything you need to know. Data validation and quality assurance is basically a series of procedural steps that you can do to make sure that the data that you collect from your clients and enter into your case management systems is both accurate and sensible. Uh, and then meet the standards, meet any standards that you may have set for its intended use as an operational a planning or decision-making tool. Uh, by decision-making tools, we mean, you know, several different things. You can use your data to plan where your organization advances its services into new areas. Uh, are there client needs that aren't being met by your current set up? Do you need to expand? Do you need to pull back from areas where the, the demand is currently dropped off? Um, more importantly, though, what data validation and quality assurance is for is for verifying that the data that you submit to your funders is accur accurately reflects what it is you do as a legal aid agency. So how can data validation and quality assurance benefit your organization? Uh, first and foremost, it gives, you fast, it gives you the ability to have faster production of your case management reports. Uh, I don't think there's probably anybody who hasn't had an instance in their career where they've gotten to the last day before a funding report is due and notice that something in their data just doesn't make sense. The numbers just don't add up or they, they're lower than estimated values. Um, by instituting a, a program of data validation and quality assurance, you can kind of anticipate and preempt those problems before they occur. Uh, another aspect of it is that you increase your accuracy, um, again, reduce time correcting the errors, and your, increase your ability to identify emerging data trends, which is something that David specializes in. David, do you want to pick up here? Um, yeah, the, so the, you're, to actually know that you're identifying something that is, um, true, you could say, or valid, um, you have, you have to have ways that make, that make clear how your data should be recorded and interpreted so that the people entering the data know what the, know what they're entering and know what options to use, and then the people analyzing and drawing conclusions from it are looking at that data with the same understanding as the people who entered it. Um, and that's really, that's really obviously central to actually identifying a trend and then knowing that the knowing that what you're looking at is something useful instead of just a collection of various bits of information that seem to indicate something. Um, and then that also relates into uh, a sound strategy for how you approach um, staffing or how you may approach deciding which cases are served, um, 
other aspects of organizational management having having a solid having a solid universal understanding of your data fields and uh, appropriate controls on how things can be entered um, are sort of your central factors there that need to be need to be addressed. Very good. And all right, so the methodology for instituting a, a program of data validation and quality assurance is basically primarily starts with the data itself. Um, you need to sit back and identify the types of data that need review and the expect data, expectations for what that data should show. Now, this can be something as simple as saying, okay, our funders ask for a lot of demographic information. We need to make sure that all our demographic questions are answered. Um, but they can also go a little, be a little more subtle than that. Like um, a good example would be when you go out in the community and you put on presentations, some, some organizations may classify the majority of that as outreach, uh, but also a legal clinic could also count as a, uh, a kind of an outreach type event. But there's often some back and forth between the two sides as to which one constitutes which and which should be kind of a funding source. Um, and so those, those are the kinds of expectations that we're talking about. You taking a look at your data and saying, this is how we want to interpret it, as David mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, the second item here is to develop, you need to develop systems and reports for monitoring the state of that data, not just at the date that the report is due, but to run as precursors up to that report, basically a monitoring system that can be in effect all year long, so that when it comes time for you to put in that end of the year grant request, you know with a, with a much higher sense of certainty that the data that you're providing that funder is correct from the get-go. Um, again, there should be regularly checked, regularly scheduled data checkups and evaluations. And my recommendation is to institute a regular program of pre-flight runs for critical funding reports. These would be things like your LSC, your IOLA, VAWA funding. You want to make sure that your date, your results are tracking with your planned estimates, your projected estimates and give yourself some time for any corrections that may be needed in case you maybe got a little too ambitious one year and project a little more than you were actually able to do. Uh, David? Yeah, and yeah so, so the the use of, so like the systems and reports, that it's sort of, it's a broad intentionally, because you, you can look at this in a, in a couple ways. Um, part of this can be how, the extent to which you can configure your case management system to accept only certain kinds of answers or certain ranges of answers, um, or to leave fields blank. It's, it's a question of thinking through what is appropriate for certain fields that you're trying to gather, and then what information um, and what level of specificity with that information you may actually need. Um, then so, so something could be configured at the level of the what the field allows, or you could set things up to be reviewed in reports that would only pull records that are outside of certain parameters that you can specify. So you can you can approach it from the front end if you have a pretty good understanding of what you want to allow in the first place, or from the back end and look for things that are outside of what you would consider normal bounds, but that you want to allow users to record in the system. Um, for like, you may want to verify, for example, a ho any, ho any household size over 10 which of course is entirely possible, but they're going to be pretty infrequent in general, or clients who are have an age of over a hundred. Um, they will certainly happen, but they're not, they're not going to be so common that actually verifying that those ages are correct 
effects would be overly burdensome. Excellent point. So now uh, we're going to talk about the core categories of data. And, and David's added the, this point at the top that data may come in a variety of forms, but ever, all of them basically end up in your in your case management system and can be extracted so that your funders, your board, and your managers, in ways that your funders, your board, and your managers may find it extremely useful. The first and foremost is probably client demographics. Almost every funding source that I've dealt with in the course of my 20 years of doing this, their primary demand is for client demographics. They want to know the racial makeup, the gender makeup, and the ages of the clients that are being served. Um, the second um, item is for your staffing allocations. You know, are your are your staff adequately spread throughout your program to handle the, the legal demands that are within your areas? Or do you instead choose to focus on a more narrow practice area, say uh, family law, family law specific? Um, Timekeeping is another option you want to take. This one can kind of tie back into certain types of grants. Uh, there are there are several types of grant applications that I've seen where you can either uh, request a lump sum for uh, a certain number of cases to be served during the course of the year, but there are also some that ask that where you can promise, say, we will we we guarantee say 10,000 hours of attorney work, uh, and so timekeeping is included here for that latter category. Grant related and grantor specific information again ties back into all of the above, um, but you may again you may have some very fine line item uh, issues that the grantors may be looking for uh, that you'll need to be able to track, identify, and report on. And then finally, geopolitical information. And this again, all of these kind of interact with each other, uh, but the geopolitical information lets you know where your data is coming from specifically. So for client demographic information, this is the meat and potatoes, uh, as we mentioned, uh, race, gender, income levels, marital status, citizenship status, disabilities, living arrangements, whether they own a home or a rental. Uh, these are most some of the more common uh, demographic information requested in most every report that I've ever uh, seen and done. Um, for staffing and time, well, David, I'm going to let you pick this up. Actually, I was going to expand a bit on the client demographic uh, information because um, certainly it is um, very common. Um, and but the answers that you may have to provide are not necessarily common among all of those all of your funding entities. Um, Everyone certainly seems to want information on, say, race and ethnicity, but they may have different funders may have different categories that they want you to report on. Um, so being aware when you're when you're looking at how you set up possible responses to really all of these categories, um, it, it's you have to consider what exactly that reporter may be demanding in terms of uh, sending information back to them. If they have specified marital statuses that they want you to use or citizenship statuses, some may some may require some may some funders may be happy with citizen or non-citizen. Others may certainly require greater detail on who is a non-citizen. Um, or, or their particular legal status within the non-citizen um, realm, you could say. Um, so having, designing your system to gather the appropriate responses and then ensuring that it can um, before you perhaps take on a grant um, or start the active period for a grant is really very necessary. Um, and then, yeah, so uh, staffing and timekeeping, um, there's really, uh, you could see a considerable overlap in how these um, reports are approached. 
Um, but you can, one way that you could sort of distinguish their use is that the timekeeping reports may focus more on how you look at the work performed by an individual, while a staffing report can be more aggregate um, to see what a unit or even the entire organization is uh, doing. Um, so while they may have a lot of the same core data regarding um, time spent on certain activities, activity codes, um, counties where activities are recorded, um, they, they would aggregate and use present that data at different levels for different kinds of decisions that your organization may be making. So, so yeah, as um, our next slide has there, um, the staffing would, could involve looking at your overall payroll, volunteer and pro bono work, looking at aggregates of time by where they happen or by physical office or um, sort or like unit within the organization if you get for say family law or housing law um, so it, it lets you see where your where the staff are working and what what sort of work is being done Um, the timekeeping is, is sort of then the, the subset um, within that, that that would look more at um, what this individual may be doing in their week, how much, how much and what kinds of work they're recording. Um, how much is being billed by certain individuals to certain grants if you're expecting to fund if you're expecting to fund a given position with uh, with one grant how much of their work is actually eligible to be billed to the grant um, and sort of giving you a window into well what is this person doing are they doing what is expected um, and then is this actually fundable perhaps by a specific grant um, and do, is this person working so much on a certain case perhaps that they need assistance um, you can you can identify if there's a particular concentration of time that may lead to them overlooking other things that they're currently assigned to be doing Um, and then, so, well, I. Go ahead, David. Oh, I just, so uh, sort of as we had mentioned, that the, the staffing and timekeeping reports may draw on a lot of this same core information, um, but you, you could distinguish them conceptually by the purpose that you're trying to have the, re the report serve. Yeah, so the things that I would point out here is, you know, this is a very, this looks like a very simple list initially, you know, funding codes, time spent, activity types. What kinds of things you can look for in your funding codes is what kind of funding codes are being built, built on your time slips. Are they temporary funding codes? Are those temporary funding codes being replaced at case close with a correct funding code? Uh, is the funding code appropriate for that case? Or is it is the casework completely LSE eligible or completely IOLA or VAWA eligible? Um, is it a perfect match? Uh, these are things you need to look at from a kind of a higher level perspective to make sure that your funding codes, that your time is being recorded to the funding codes that they need to be recorded to, or that they may possibly be recorded to in another manner. Uh, again, time spent in the activity types, as David pointed out, those could be indicators of of a need where where you have some work you see some work that could be overlooked because of an excess amount of excessive amount of time being spent in one area uh staff types and roles uh 
some some of the things that you want to look for here is are who's doing the bulk of the work are is it is it falling on is most of the time being recorded by your attorneys or by your intake staff um volunteer status a good thing to look for here is if the volunteer timekeeping um is sluggish or and i know this is from from experience with a lot of pro bono programs that sometimes the pro bono act advocates do not always get back with updates on their time expense on those cases well when that happens that can sometimes lead to the pro bono coordinator looking at them and seeing that it's looking at their record and seeing that there's a uh, uh, either a surplus or an overage of time commitment. This case has been sitting with this pro bono advocate for X number of days, weeks, or months. Then I'm going to be less likely to assign that pro bono advocate another case because it looks as if they're still busy with the other one. Um, county of residence ties ties back in closely with um, county of dispute. Um, you may have an advocate who's uh, specialty is in another who is all the forms and all the practical experience to work in a county. I know this is a big problem here in the southeast where each of the metro Atlanta counties has different procedural practices for divorce cases, evictions. And so if you have an advocate that's more familiar with the procedures that need to take place within that area, then maybe they, they need to be shifted over and assigned to the cases that deal with that area. Uh, and then, of course, physical and organizational office, as, as David noted, if, if you notice that a lot of work is coming from a region uh, that is outside your normal sphere of influence, um, maybe that's an indicator that a, that a new office needs to be looked at, or maybe an office that's more close, close to that area could pick up some of the load. Uh, David, you want to pick up for Grant? Uh, sure. Um, so there's actually, uh, as you may know, a number of things sort of loop back uh, to prior themes where a lot of legal service entities are funded by a lot of different funders. So you, your funders will very often present specific um, specific reporting requirements that relate to how they want to hear about what you're doing uh, with their funds. And so you have to ensure that your system is uh, designed in such a way that the data that they require can be uh, reported to them and that even the options for data that you're already gathering permit you to be responsive to a new funder while remaining able to report to all of your prior funders. Um, and so you may also, as an aside, like you may be able to say to a funder, well, we gather this information in this way and present to them a sample of the kinds of data that you can report to see if that is appropriate or acceptable for what they're doing um, and the extent that they may allow you to um, use an existing report or fields obviously may vary. But um, if you're able to present in a clear way, this is data that we are used to reporting in this fashion, um, that may be helpful to them in deciding what exactly they need to hear from you about the work that you're doing. Okay, geographical information, uh, just as, you know, legal aid, you guys are all over the place. Uh, all politics is local and geopolitical analysis shows you just how local your problems are. Um, which types are concentrated in which areas, how your client demographics are distributed within those areas. Um, national funders are generally really big on this kind of this kind of data because again, they don't know your neighborhood as well as you do. Um, so putting together reports that translate your knowledge into something that they can understand and and visualize is certainly useful. Um, 
but it also helps you, uh, it helps you as a firm identify trends within your region. You may be looking at your, your geographical reports and notice that for you know the last six months of the previous year, uh, your number of health law cases increased in a specific region of of your state or or even a county. Um, is that an indication of a of a trend emerging? Do you need to devote resources to that trend? Only you will know, and and the way that you can know that is by again by monitoring the geographical information throughout the course of a year. Um, David has another example here that, that I'm going to let him explain. Sure. Yeah. So this was, um, we, we are trying to increasingly use, um, GIS type analysis. Um, and so one of, um, one of the, one of the things that, um, we attempted to look at was, um, were we receiving intakes? from across our service area um, in roughly in line with the poverty, the, the percentage of po eligible population within the area. Um, so this is one of the kinds of ways that geographic analysis can help you understand what your organization is doing and where the clients you serve are coming from. Um, as a short explanation, so th this map in the, the red areas were uh, subdivisions of counties where we had fewer intakes than you may have expected given the underlying eligible population. Um, and then the white were around what you would expect and the blue were over what you may expect. Um, and so you can you can look at different you can combine different um, geographic levels. Um, these are mainly county subdivisions, but then the city of Cleveland itself you can is divided into the wards of the city, and this it was all based on underlying census tract information to build in all of the population uh, figures that were needed to conduct uh, the analysis. Then obviously to do this, then you need all the correct addresses um, entered in a way that they can be geocoded. Um, as you can see in some of the small font, there was an 86% success at geocoding um, addresses recorded at intake. Um, when all this information was done, um, we were using PICA um, and had a very, all, basically all the address information was for the most part um, uh, just free text input. People, the intake staff could record whatever they needed to record in those fields. Um, and there was relatively little validation that happened at the data entry point. Or data entry level, um, so 86% it, it seemed relatively good for that. Um, the it, it was that tens of thousands of contacts, so there wasn't really any correction that was done after the fact to try to make more matches. Um, but it's this is just an illustration of how um, geographic information. Um, can show you interesting things about work, your work. Okay, so the next slide here, this is where we start to begin talking about some of the things that you can do to improve your data quality and uh, data validity. This is the, this is the how to section. And um, this, a lot of this will depend on your relationships with your database vendor, your database designer, uh, and also your own experiences with your case management system. But some of the typical steps that you can try, and, and we're going to give some uh, practical examples on, on why, these, why these should occur, are prohibit null values on critical fields. What a null value means is a blank. Um, a good example here would be, again, your demographic information. If your client 
is if you're not getting your client's demographic information, then your report demographics are going to be slightly off. Um, numerical fields or date fields, restricting them to same values. Uh, the example here is, will a family side ex ever exceed more than two digits? You ever going to have a family, a, a family law case where your the number of kids is numbers more than 99? Uh, if not, then restrict the field size to two digits. Don't allow a free form of more than four or five characters. Every now and then, we call it keep, you know cat keyboard typing. Somebody may rest a finger a little too long on a on a number key and and add an extra digit. Um, and if you have a field restriction, uh, that extra digit can often be can be prevented ahead of time. Uh, another same uh, another example of the same value on a date field um, would be like uh, setting restrictions on how far ahead or how far back your timekeeping can occur. Uh, timekeeping under most grant conditions is required to be done. In a, in a timely manner. Um, we would ideally, they would prefer that everybody get their timekeeping done on that day. I know my boss certainly feels that way. Uh, but the fact of the matter is sometimes you just can't keep up and you need to go back and you need to get caught up with your timekeeping for a week or a month or whatever. Um, however, allowing that past date entry to go for too long can leave you with serious holes in your timekeeping data. You may have a, an attorney who, who forgot to enter his timekeeping for months and months. And if, if you're not restricting them or preventing them from, from allowing it to go that long, then, then the chances are the, the problems with the data entry is not, are not going to correct themselves. Another thing you want to do is just pre prevent anything from being entered in the future. Um, I do a lot of data migrations for, uh, firms going from one database to another. And one of the more common uh, aspects of that migration is a substantial amount of date cleanup where, uh, again, it just these are just typos. Uh, somebody types in 2019 instead of 2019 instead of 1999, or they type in 9999, uh, or sometimes they drop it, they didn't just do 201 and hit tab over to the next field. And now we have somebody that looks like they were born in the second century. Um, setting restrictions on the date field, you can also control the formatting of the date field these ways and, and the numerical values. These are just little ways to kind of help correct for more, what, what I would call more the more common typos you're just gonna see within a case management system. Uh, to tie back in with the previous slide for addresses, particularly if you're going to be working with um, things like geocoding, the validity of the address is very important. Um, sometimes you will have uh, attorneys that will enter in or intake workers that will enter in a client's address uh, based on the apartment name because the client just assumes that the apartment name is the street address. Um, if the apartment resides on Elm Street, but the apartment name is Elm Street Oaks, uh, in order for it to be geocoded, the Elm Street is what needs to be entered, what needs to be entered. And so for these types of things, you may have to get with your intake staff and or your advocates and make sure they have an understanding of how the apartment addresses are being um, relayed, both from the client perspective and entered into your system. Uh, we'll have another slide coming up to show some ways that you can check check the quality of that data entry over time, but it's, it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, another thing, other things that you can do is you can set thresholds on timekeeping to prohibit a case from going, going on for too long. Um, this also ties back in with monitors on the date open or date close field. Let's say you had a case that opened in 2006 uh, it's gone through a number of appeals. It's still open, but it's been two or three years since anybody's done any activity on that case. You can build up a report that monitors the last state of activity on that and then goes back to the manager and lets them know, okay, it's been X number of weeks since attorney since the attorney revisited this case. Maybe it's time for a nudge. Um, grant billing. 
uh, is a little bit uh, a little bit of a more tricky thing to do. It depends on again on the systems that you have set up and how your accounting systems work. But a lot of this, one of the things that you can do with grant bills, you can prohibit the um, staff from entering time onto a grant that has already been used up. Say, for example, you have a hundred thousand dollar grant uh, by February. You've worked all the cases you can. You've already booked um 100,000 hours to that grant or you booked uh $100,000 worth of attorney time to that grant from that point forward no one else can bill any more time to that grant without uh triggering an alert um and then finally you know all of these design changes all lead back to one thing and that is constant review 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 your data doesn't remain static. Your client base doesn't remain static. Your client population moves. Your, your demographic shift. Your caseloads wither and die or will increase and become more demanding. Only by keeping a review on this information can you keep ahead of where, where you need to be as a business. Your, your legal service office is first and foremost a business and it needs to have make sound business decisions on where it devotes its resources in order to better serve its clients so the following slides are going to be a number of um, we're going to show you a number of some sample reports that can set up uh, you can set up uh, we're going to give um, examples of things to look for within the reports, little red flags that you should notice. Uh, one of the things I want, one of the points that I want to make clear here is that um, when looking at reports to review or case man management reports to review, there is a tendency within, within the community to look at these with a more personal interest. Um, by that, I mean, you're looking at this case, you're looking at this case list and you're saying, does this meet my immediate grant needs? Um, what, uh, what, a, what a quality assurance and, and data validation is about is taking the personal out of it. You're gonna step back a little bit from your data. You wanna look at it from a more, a more disconnected, broader view and take away your personal investment and what you want to see and train yourself to look for things that you didn't expect to see. All right, moving on to the examples. The first one here is a basic case report. Whoops, sorry, that was my fault. Uh, a basic case report. Uh, these are, you know, the bread and butter of every case management system. You can, these can be generated fairly quickly um, built up to capture the kind of basic information in this particular instance, describing predominantly demographic information. Um, so you can track, you know, how your funding codes are being distributed, whether or not there are gaps in your funding code, uh, whether the close reasons make sense, or whether or not there's a stray code in there that doesn't. Um, your eligibility, again, looking for holes in data and gender. Uh, one good thing to point out here is uh, uh, there's a number of database systems that have fields for number of people under 18, number of people over 18, and they also have a companion field for total household size. Some of the things you wanna look for are some disagreements between those fields. Do, do, your, do, your, do your children and your adults add up to the overall household size, or has some, or has the math gone wrong somewhere? The next one is a user management report. Now there is a side. I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna spin off on a, a little side joint here. Uh, there's a security aspect to the user management report. The primary purpose of a user account review is to make sure that your salary is entered, your, uh, if your staff are entered in correctly. Um, you also keep a little, you can keep track of their, their case loads to see if they have an excessive number of open cases or closed cases or too low. Uh, you can check their, from a payroll and accounting perspective, you can check their exemption status, make sure their salary information is correct. Uh, you can even track, um, you know, 
payroll leave balances, uh, sick time, vacation time. But one of the other things that you can do, and I would con I would encourage you to do, is to review the the accounts that have access to your case management systems, and to do these on a very regular basis, no less than quarterly. One of the things you want to make sure of is should everybody that has access to your case management system, should they have that access? Have you had an employee leave in the last month that can still access your case management system and all your client information? Was that departure hostile in any way? Those are some of the security concerns that I want to bring up with the user management review. You just want to make sure that your staff that are in there belong in there and the staff that aren't don't. David, do you have anything to add here for user sign? Um, not with the users. I, I was going to say actually within the just a brief point. So your your reports, if you all the reports should look at way things that need to be checked that you couldn't configure the the the, the appropriate um, values for um, at the at the in at the data input stage when you with the example of people under 18 and over 18 and total household size your system may have that as three separate fields that require entry and you could permit that or you could try to design your system so that you enter number of people at under 18 and number of people over 18 and then have the total household size be automatically calculated and not allow user input for that. Um, both the one obviously fixes the problem of the two not summon, but there's still the, the possibility that someone may enter a value incorrectly. So you would still want to review those numbers for their reasonability, but you could design the check on the total size either to occur at the time of entry or to occur when you review the data in the report. And that's that's a decision that is really up to you on how your organization is going to enter and check data. All right. Uh, no, so our next example here is a uh, a timekeeping report that shows cases with no time or no time entered in X number of days. This is the one uh, that we were mentioning that I mentioned earlier about uh, cases that have gone stale or stagnant. Um, these are actual numbers, believe it or not. Um, they are they have come from uh, uh, an amalgamation of uh, client systems. Uh, the data has been anon anonymized and the, the client systems will not be identified. But as you can see here, there's a lot of range uh, in, in the number of days that some of these cases have been worked. Now, these may be valid uh, time frames. You may have a case that's undergone multiple appeals over the course of the year. So what you want to do here is you want to compare your number of days since the last activity versus, versus against the date of that last activity. Has it? Why has nobody touched this case since 2012? Uh, it, or did somebody just not update a case at that point? These are the kinds of, of um, case management aspects that are often overlooked uh, in a legal aid agency. And a lot of this can also tie back in with the user review that we mentioned before. You may have, um, if you don't have the proper protocols in place, when an employee leaves your firm, they may have left a handful of cases open. And if you don't have the protocols in place to ensure that those cases get picked up by another advocate, then you run the chance, you run the risk of having those cases remain open indefinitely and turn up on a report such as this. Uh, at which point you have to decide, okay, have, you know, how can we correct this problem? You know, are we running the risk of malpractice here by not speaking to this client since, you know, for X number of years? Um, this is one way in which two separate reports can kind of inter interact with each other. And that's one of the overriding themes of this whole talk is that 
you know, your data, your data is constantly lacing itself through other data. Uh, and by stepping back and taking a broader over, overview, you can sometimes identify areas that may have escaped your notice before. David, anything to add here? Uh, no, don't think so. All right, the next one here is just a sample grant goals report. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, grants come in, in in multiple forms, some of which are, you know, how many hours did we spend on the grant or how many or how much money, how much attorney time, and how does that translate into dollar amounts spent on the grant? Uh, I don't know why both these charts have dollar signs in them. One is supposed to be a straight number. Uh, but basically, this is a good way of visualizing how your how your grant expenses are going throughout the course of the year. Uh, certain systems, you can set these up manually. Other, you may need to dump the data to Excel and work this up yourself. Um, but basically, there are simple values where you take the, the, for the first chart, for example, shows that we were, Vala gave this firm uh, $565,000. And as of this point in the year, they've, we've only booked 148,000 of attorney time, um, or attorney charges, sorry. And the same thing applies on, on the second chart, but from a time book standpoint. Again, should not say dollar signs. Uh, and this shows you how your case time is being spent with regard to that uh, grant work, grant related work. David, anything to add here? Uh, yes. Yeah, so one thing, of course, to be aware of if you have if you have um, your staff selecting funding codes is also to review the cases. Um, or activities that have actually been assigned to those funding codes. So you may see the, the, a report showing, well, this is all the time we have in this funding code and that's worth this amount of money, but you also need to look behind that to ensure that the, the activities for which that funding code was selected are actually eligible to be funded by that grant. Um, so you have this overall view of how much has been accorded to the grant, and then you need a behind the scenes view of what exactly has been allocated to the grant. Okay, uh, another another report you can do is a simple, this is a very simple one, um, just to let you know when your grant, grant renewals are coming up. Uh, you can record your, your the contract term start dates and end dates in uh, a lot of your accounting and case management systems. Uh, you can build up, you can set up, um, I know within the legal server systems, you can set up an automated email reminder, uh, which is what the, the graphic there to the right uh, that is delivered, can be delivered on a schedule, um, say the first of the month, middle of the month, uh, to let you know what, what expirations are coming up and then you can begin prepare, preparing for the grant renewal process or giving yourself um, room enough to get the timekeeping caught up before that grant expiration comes due. All uh, this sec this next one is kind of a, to build on uh, David's comment about looking at the back, back end. This is another kind of um, tracking the grant expenditures over time though in this particular one we're looking at a, a a dap contract that has gone from 2014 to 2018 and we've got a historical tracking of how much that grant has been has pulled in each year and how close the company has come to to meeting the conditions of that grant there are a couple years in there that were um where their system was not tracking um this one can show you again, you know, whether or not you're going over budget on a grant or or maintaining, uh, staying on track with what you what you projected to the funding source. Uh, David, any comment here? No, no. Think that's it. All right, address validation reports. Um, this is a simple one. Um, this one just basically tracks. This is from a legal service system which has a GIS module that can be plugged in. 
Um, and as one of the aspects of that module is that it does an automatic uh, GIS validation. It does a lookup with the US Postal Service database and verifies the address that's being entered uh, is registered within that database. And if so, it gives it a mark of pass or fail uh, on the back end of the database. And this is just a simple report right here that uh, pulls a list of cases that have passed or failed that um, data validation and geocoding check. Uh, you could build something similar to this. Uh, again, to go to refer back to David's map where he was talking about the 84% sec success rate on the geocode side. 84% um, is, is extremely high. I think the best I have ever seen on a national level has been a 92% success rate on geocoding. So one thing to keep in mind is even though the ideal is 100, you're probably never going to see that. Uh, and the simple reason is, is that a lot of this depends on government data. Uh, from the, again, from the post office primarily, uh, and everybody is still building. Uh, you'll have new neighborhoods coming in once a week, almost within your area. And until those neighborhoods get picked up by the post office, you may not have an address that validates at that point. So address validation reports become necessary because you can revisit them throughout the course of the year. What failed to check in January may pass again in March. And so this report lets me know to go back, revisit those cases, rerun those checks and see if they pass. And then it becomes a self-correcting report in a way and that as they, as more and more get corrected, that list gets smaller and smaller. Uh, case activity report. What this is, is this is a report that's basically tracking the time expenses by hours on a case. Now I have to scooch my little window here out of the way for a while. Uh, you see what we've done here is we've broken the vertical columns down by zero to 20 hours all the way up to 200 hours or more. And you'll notice here that we have a couple particularly down on, I can't, can I highlight this though? Uh, there we go. Uh, can everybody see the red dot? Where what I'm doing is I'm pointing at about the, the seven the row, the 75 SSI at the very end, we have one hour, one unit of time booked under the 200 hour point. And what that means is that the, after, after 200 hours, whoops, sorry, that the case has already exceeded the 200 hour threshold and there's still being time entered on it. Um, is that an indication of a case gone rogue or is that an indication of another uh, appeal taking place? Only you will be able to know, but this kind of monitoring right here lets you know where the bulk of your case time entry is being focused on. Or, or this is basically a, another way of saying this is our case turnaround time. The majority of our work appears to be falling within the zero to 20 hour range, although we do have a few outliers, outliers that exceed that. Uh, when you see those numbers, you want to make you ask yourself as a firm, you know, do we need, is this an indication that we need more people? Or do we need to spend more focus on these particular areas of law? Uh, David, I think you, had, you, you wanted to build on this a little bit. Uh, well, so, and I think this was partly the, the interpretation of this report in particular was showing the top four cases opened in a month how much time has been recorded on them. So this may also reveal errors that people may have in their time. If you see a case that has more than 200 hours recorded on it in the same month that it opened, someone may have submitted a time slip that has an incorrect number of hours on it. Um, so it, it's reports that look for outlier or suspect information are really your friend in a variety of contexts contexts for trying to ensure that all of the data in your system is as accurate as it can be. All right. 
All right, and then from here on out, we're going to show you some reports from other systems. David is going to explain the majority of these. Sure, yeah. Uh, so and, uh, um, the flags associated with them. Yeah. So this was, these were all reports constructed um, in Crystal um, that we used when we, when we had uh, PICA as our, as our um, CMS. Um, and so we had the open, open case aging um, sort of gave a variety of uh, indicators for at the individual advocate level um which cases they had open the problems they were in how long those cases had been open um how much time had been recorded <clears throat> excuse me in those cases and then when that time had be, has been recorded in the case's history and ultimately how long it's been since anything happened in that case so it served a variety of purposes all in one to see how much, how long have we spent on, say, this a given case? When was the bulk of that activity? Are we are we basically just waiting for uh, uh, the case to close? Um, has a case been left open without any activity? If if this had been a different page, as that day since last activity increased, if it's over 30, then it highlights that in particular as you need to pay attention to this case, why has it been 30 days since anything has been recorded for it? And that may be for a perfectly valid reason, but it's something that the manager of this employee would look at as these reports were automatically generated and sent periodically. Um, <clears throat> and the next slide, um, so this was the case contradiction. So we had our we our implementation of PICA was fairly um, open in what we would allow people to do in terms of recording information in fields, and a lot of what would be cleaned up was then checked on with checked through reports. Um, the, like this particular report would highlight instances of cases where there was some sort of illogical or incorrect combination of fields that uh, were recorded for that case. Like you can see um, rejected without a close date, there was just missing a date, or rejected with a closed code we had the status of the case being rejected, but then we had a close, we had a, cert a closing code that implied service. So obviously there'd be something wrong with that case as it cannot be both rejected and closed with service. Um, and the next slide for this actually shows the, um, shows the definitions of what each of those categories specifically is looking for so that even the, a new person coming in and looking at this report knows exactly what fields have been set to what values to trigger this report pulling that case and saying, hey, there's an error here that needs to be resolved. Um, these report, the report could also, this one is not specifically configured to do it, but you could also look for a logical contradiction like a closed date that precedes an open date. So you can require that your closed date be filled out, but you may not be able to require that the closed date be later or the same date as the open date. So you'd want to be sure that someone doesn't accidentally type in the wrong year and close the case before they ever actually opened it. Um, so designing reports that look for possible logical contradictions in your data um, can be very helpful, particularly for situations where you can't program or set up the fields at the input stage to only accept logical values even cross-checked against other values already recorded in the case. And this brings um, up, and this, this, this brings up another, another point just to reinforce the earlier point about 
the need for periodic review. I mean, you, you can make, you can run a report like this and see that you have lots of problems with, let's say the reject, a case can be rejected without a close date. Um, okay, so you make, an, uh, you make an adjustment to your case management system to fix that. Does the problem go away? Um, or does the problem emerge somewhere else? Uh, does the same problem emerge somewhere else? Uh, only by doing these regular reviews and, and looking for these kinds of anomalies can you eventually get to the point where your, your quality assurance levels begin to increase and reach a higher and higher accuracy threshold. So that, that constant review is, is, I can't understate that enough, is necessary. Time consuming, but yes, it's necessary. Yeah. And so the missing demographics report is very similar conceptually to the case contradiction report. Um, it's just that in this case, the data fields that we want to require on a case were null. And so this brings up an interesting point in that you could set all of these fields simply to be required and say, uh, I believe I believe all of these are gathered um, at intake for this report and simply not allow the intake to proceed until all of these uh, values are filled out. That may result in you having to stop certain intakes depending on what information you're able to get from the client at the time that they're calling in. Um, or you could take the approach of allowing the intake to proceed and then reviewing after the case may have opened, what information do we need to get to fully fill out um, the, the file for this client? Um, you, you, so you may allow a field to be null initially, but you may ultimately want to get that information. And that's, this kind of report can help you in that regard to see, well, what is being missed and what should we try to get for this case to um, have a complete set of, in this case, mainly demographic information about the client. And so then our next slide um, is a sort of combined um, staffing and timekeeping report, depending on the level at which the report was run. This report could be configured to pull for individual staff members, or you could configure it for groups of different kinds, either all of your staff attorneys or all of your managing attorneys or everyone in the housing unit. Um, different aggregations could be looked at to see what categories of time they were recording, case matters, supporting time, vacation time, how much had been recorded in the year, and then breakdowns of specific programs that had had time recorded in them or specific funding codes where that time had been allocated. And so it would give a perspective both if you're looking to see what an individual is doing or how a unit is according its time, say, to a funding code or, or to different programs. Um, you may expect that one unit records a lot of time under bankruptcy, um, but if you see other case time recorded for that group, that may show that perhaps they're opening related cases for a client and, and they're being having time recorded in that, um, or others, other anomalies or unexpected ways that people are working that a report like this could allow you to review. Um, and then that this is the last of sort of these examples. Oh, so um, resources, uh, there's, there's, there's there's an awful, <laughs> this is a highly technical topic. So the best we can offer as far as the resources are, you know, we, we, 
we've spoken here about um, a lot of the reports came from the legal server site. Uh, so there's a link here to the legal server help pages, which goes into the database design and the individual elements of the site. Uh, NTAP has a number of resources available for some resources available for database design um, and structure, but primarily your, 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 your majority of your technical resources are going to come from your database developers and your database um, managers, your, your IT specialists, your, your ultra geeks uh, who can get inside your access or your legal server or your SQL databases and can set these fields up for you in a manner that is best suited to your needs. Um, that there's, a, there's too many different sources for me to link to here. Um, but speak to your legal server, speak to your database developer, your case management developer, talk to them about some of the concerns that you may have, that may have been raised by this discussion. And they will be more than happy to help you work, help work with you to figure out ways to deal with these problems within your case management system. Bear in mind that it is up to them to satisfy your needs, not the other way around. You know, you're paying for a product and, and part of the product is that it, it gives you the data you actually need. And uh, yeah, well, go ahead, David. Oh, I was just going to say this was this is also an area. Um, I mean, in a way, it goes without saying, but um, your your colleagues um, across the country, everyone is dealing with the same sorts of problems relating to data and funder requirements for information, and so consulting others who are in the same situation but may have decided on, well, we reasoned it out this way and it works very well for these applications, um, can be um, very helpful in trying to decide how to design your system or what, um, what data you gather where and how you allow it to be entered. Um, but once you have made all of those decisions, um, which you've never really made all of them because it, it you will change over time in the data you record, you should be certain that everyone knows how the system works, how to record data correctly, and what all of the funding abbreviated funding codes and different parts of the system mean so that data is being recorded with a common understanding of what it means and that the data is being analyzed with the same understanding as the people who were recording it. So creating a reference guide or cheat sheet to give an overview, um, particularly of um, fields that are extremely important, um, like closing codes, funding codes, what a program applies to, what the rules are for saying, does the case involve domestic violence, or what options you should select for citizenship attestation. Um, these very sort of central um, data points, it's very important that everyone knows this is what you choose in this situation. So uh, a reference guide like this page, and then this this is just a front and back, this, this slide and the next slide, um, to give a clear indication to staff, this is how you record these core aspects of our work so that everyone knows what is being done and where it's being done and for whom it's being done in a clear and consistent fashion. All right, the mantra of any, any IT person that you'll talk to is documentation, documentation, documentation. And on, on this note is, is how we'd like to close, close out this session. Um, there are a lot of issues here to look at. There are a lot of variables that are in play. Uh, case management systems are huge. They're, they're complicated, but so is the practice of law. And part of the function of a case management system is to operate as 
uh, an appendage of the law to to serve the needs of the law and to serve you as its users in a way that helps you make sense of your clients and your activities. Um, but there's a give and take, and, and that give and take involves you translating to the case management system as much as the, tra the case management system translates back to you. And so be sure to document everything that you do. Try to keep it as clear and concrete as possible. Uh, and make sure that, as David says, everyone is a, everyone operates on the same page, and then that's probably the greatest assist you're going to get to your data quality and data validation projects that we could ever offer. So on that note, um, we'd like to close out. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to listen. Uh, David and my contact information is here on this slide. And we look forward to any questions or comments in the future.